Welcome to Grace Walk. I have so enjoyed sharing with you the teachings that we've been doing over the last months together about the Bible and how to understand the Bible. I have uh, read the Bible since I was a small child. I, I, I really can't remember a time in my life when I didn't read the Bible. I've taught, taught from the Bible since I was a 16 year old boy. That was a long time ago. My, the first time I ever stood up and spoke in a church was at the age of 16 years old. I've always loved the Bible. But for a lot of years I didn't understand a lot about it. And the reason I didn't understand a lot was because of the way I approached it. Nobody had ever taught me how to interpret scripture. I mean, I would read the whole Bible in the same way so that if I was reading in Genesis or reading in Revelation, it, I just read it at face value and I tried to interpret it with the, with the, the only lens that I had. But a time came when I began to realize that this Bible, this Bible that I hold here has 66 books. If you're a Roman Catholic, you have the apocryphal books, but either way, your Bible was written over a long period of time and written by a lot of different people and it was written to different audiences and in different contexts. And I began to realize that those things matter. And there is a unified message in the scripture as we've been talking about and we're going to talk about today, which is Christ. But in order to understand the scripture, there are distinctions that we need to make in the way we approach it. You don't read the book of Leviticus the way you read the book of Ephesians or you're going to get in trouble because they're not the same. They're different in many ways. Well, as I grew in my own understanding of Scripture and how to interpret, how to study and read, it transformed my whole relationship to the Bible and it affected the way I saw not only what Scripture says, but it affected the way that I saw God it affected the way that I saw myself. It affected the way that I saw the world around me. And so when it was all said and done, I realized that there are a lot of people that are in the same place that I was in, and that is their heart is sincere, and they love their Bible, and they want to learn, and they want to grow, but they don't necessarily know how to approach it. So I wrote a book that we've been studying from in this series of teachings, and the book is called Unlock Your Bible. You can get the book on Amazon.com. It's a short, simple book to understand, and yet it's a book that will give you the guidance that you need for interpreting the Scripture in the most effective way. Now, I've given you some key points, some pivotal points about interpreting Scripture that revolve around five questions, which are all uh, discussed in various chapters in the book. And to review... Question number one, which half of my Bible am I reading? Because there's a big difference between old and new. Question two, are you talking to me? Because the audience in the Bible is different at different times. The, the, the people to whom those words were directed, they're not all directed to you at every minute, right? Uh, you aren't being told to go out and offer a burnt offering, for instance. All right, the third question, when was that said? Because, you know, Paul, for instance, was talking in New Testament times about specific circumstances that specific and individual churches faced. And the things he said to them, you wouldn't take it and apply it today. You say, of course I would, really? I've mentioned before, so you think there's a certain way then you need to treat slaves? I mean, I'm being sarcastic. Because obviously you know the horror of, of slavery, but Paul was writing to people who didn't know the horror of it and the purpose of his instruction at that point was not the abolishment of slavery, but rather to help them understand this is the world you're living in, like it or not. So since you're living in this side of this world, in this context, here's how to be as Christ-like as you can be inside that context. So when was it said? And then the next question was, aren't we to do what Jesus said? And we spent considerable time on that because um, that uh, is something that causes a lot of misunderstanding. And then finally, uh, we've been discussing what is the topic of this passage. And I've saved what I think is the best till last because I've been talking with you about the importance of a Christocentric approach 
to the Bible. And I've said that if you read the Bible just so you can learn how to live, you've missed the point altogether. You've totally missed the point. Does the Bible give us instruction on how to live? Well, yes, it does, but that's not the main purpose of the Bible. If you're studying the Bible, and many have studied the Bible just to get a historical understanding of the people of God, if that's the only reason you've studied or read your Bible, you've missed the point. You missed it. Does the Bible give us historical insight about the people of God? Of course. Absolutely it does. But that's not what the Bible is for. That's not what it's for at all. The Bible is given to us to point us to a person. And that person is Christ. He is the sum and center of all Scripture. He said to the Pharisees, you search and study the Bible, the Scriptures, because you think you're going to find life in them. But, you notice the conjunction, the contrast he uses? Listen to what he said to Pharisees. You study the Scripture because you think you will find life in them. But, these are they that testify of me, but you won't come to me. Let me tell you something. The only life this Bible has to offer you is the life of Jesus Christ. I didn't say it. Jesus did. You study your Bible thinking you're going to find life in your Bible study. But you won't unless it points you to Jesus Christ and you come to Him. That is the reason for the Scripture. And if we miss that, we've missed it all. We need to know that both the Old Testament, Old Covenant, and New Covenant each must be understood in their proper context, but Jesus Christ stands as a centerpiece of every age. He is the unchangeable constant who forever has and forever will reveal the love of His Father to us. So to unlock your Bible, you've got, you got to see Him there. You, you, you do your daily Bible reading? Are you, are you reading your Bible just so, uh, you know, a lot of people use it like a horoscope. <laughs> I hate to say it, but they do. They use it like a horoscope. Let me, let me read my Bible this morning and kind of get a sense of what my day is going to be. Or let me read my Bible tonight before I go to bed and help me interpret my day. I, I mean, I've told you before the flip and point method that people have used with the Bible. And, and again, I'll say what I said before. God will meet you where you are. If I'm young and immature in my faith, God will meet me at my immature level. But that's not the best approach to the Bible. We don't come to the Bible for that reason. We come to the Bible to meet Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to share with you something that I wrote in this book. I'm going to read it to you, actually, because I just want to read to you right out of the last chapter of this book, something about Jesus throughout all the Bible. But we'll do that when we come right back after this commercial break. So we've said a lot of words about the Bible. And at the end of it all, it comes down to one word. And that word is Jesus. The whole Bible points to Jesus Christ. Not just the New Testament Scriptures, but the Old Testament Scriptures too. People that downplay the Old Testament Scriptures do so because they don't understand the value there. Jesus is in the Old Testament just like He's in the New Testament. I think it was, uh, I think it was Augustine who said, uh, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. And I, I think that it was Augustine who said that. And the point being that Jesus is there in all the Scripture. I mean, if you think of the Bible like a photo album, uh, well, in the New Testament, Jesus is standing right in the front. Uh, he's in the front of every picture. You can clearly see Him. But if you look in the Old Testament, I'll say it like this. Do you remember, uh, do you remember the, the Where's Waldo uh, strip, you know, where's Waldo? The, you remember that? The, the guy in the striped shirt and they would hide him in the picture and the drawing and you'd have to look at the picture and it would be a very busy picture and somewhere Waldo was in there and you'd have to find him. Well, you got my point if you know that, that, that example. 
Well, in the Old Testament, it's like Jesus, sometimes it feels like where's Waldo, but he is there. Let me read you something, and I don't, I don't typically read to you, but let me read you something right out of my book that I think that will clearly help you see what I'm talking about, Jesus in the Old Testament Scriptures. Every book of the Old Testament is about Him. In Genesis, He's the seed of the woman that would defeat Satan himself to rescue you. In Exodus, He's the Passover lamb who took sin's penalty upon Himself. In Leviticus, He's the scapegoat that carries sins away. Numbers reveals Him as the guiding cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He's our place of refuge. Joshua presents Jesus as the captain of our salvation. In Judges, He's the one who takes weak people and makes them miraculously strong. In Ruth, He's the kinsman redeemer who rescues us from disaster. 1 Samuel presents Jesus as the prophet of the Lord. 2 Samuel shows Him to be a faithful friend. In 1 Kings, He's the one about whom the half has never been told. 2 Kings reveals Him as the God who restores our cutting edge when we've lost it. 1 Chronicles assures us He is the enlarger of our territory. In 2 Chronicles, He is our shout of victory in the fierce battles of life. Ezra shows He's the fulfiller of our dreams. In Nehemiah, He is the rebuilder of our broken walls and lives. In Esther, He is our protector during vulnerable times. Job declares He is our Redeemer who in latter days will stand upon the earth. In Psalms, He's our Good Shepherd. In Proverbs, He is the wisdom of God given to us. Ecclesiastes shows Jesus to be eternity set in our hearts. In the Song of Solomon, He is our lover and our bridegroom. Isaiah reveals Him as the suffering servant who took sin's pain on our behalf. In Jeremiah, He's the righteous branch from which our own righteousness is produced. Lamentations brings Him to us as the one who is great in faithfulness. In Ezekiel, He's the breath that brings dry bones to life. In Daniel, Jesus is the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Hosea presents Him as the one who forgives the worst sins imaginable. In Joel, He's the baptizer with the Spirit. In Amos, He's our burden bearer. Obadiah declares Him to be our Savior. In Jonah, He's the one raised up after three days. In Micah, He is our hope in helpless situations. In Nahum, He is the God who turns ruin into splendor. In Habakkuk, He is the source and sustainer of our faith. Zephaniah shows the Lord Jesus to be the Lord mighty to save. Haggai shows He's the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, He's the pure sun. And in Malachi, Jesus is the Son of Righteousness rising with healing in His wings. It's all Jesus. He's the topic of the whole Bible. He's the darling of the ages. And the focal point of all that exists. He's the creator, the sustainer, the nurturer of your life. In fact, Jesus Christ is your life. Paul the Apostle said, In Him we live and move and have our being. In another place he said, uh, When Christ who is our life shall appear. When you read your Bible, the proper objective in reading is to encounter Him, to see and experience His presence with you and in you, to show you the Father's empowering love that equips you to live in the awareness and in the power of that love every day. It's all about Jesus Christ. Let's not get bogged down in the Bible. What a, what a thing to say. What a thing to say. It almost sounds heretical. Let's not get bogged down in the Bible. But listen, you're looking at a guy who was a pastor 
for 21 years. I've been a believer since I was a child. I've traveled six continents and I've been in churches of every denomination you can think of. And I can tell you from my own personal experience and from my own observation in the world of the church, of every shape and stripe and shade and flavor, there is the risk that people get bogged down in the content of the Bible and miss the Christ of the Bible. Again, if you consider yourself as one who lives by the Bible, I want to lovingly admonish you to just repent of that. Change your mind. Paul said, I no longer live. And then he went on to speak to his source. I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. And I no longer live. Did, it, did he say this, correct or incorrect? But the life that I now live, I live by my obedience to the Bible. Is that what he said? <laughs> no. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live by the life of Christ. And the Bible will teach us how to do that. But we don't live by the Bible. Do you see the distinction? Well, we've gone a long way down this road together and I'm going to wrap it up with a conclusion that I hope will bring it all together when we come back right after this break. Well, I don't know if you're aware of it, but we've been studying for 13 weeks, 13 sessions together about this book, the Bible. And obviously we could study for 13 years about the Bible and never hardly skim the surface. But what I've been trying to do as we've gone through this series of studies together is to help you understand a better way to approach your Bible. And this, this book, uh, Unlock Your Bible, that you can get on Amazon uh, will reinforce the things that we've talked about together here. And I hope that you'll, I hope that you'll uh, lock in on this. I, I trust that you are better equipped to read your Bible so that you can understand and apply its teaching to your life in a way that's helpful. The scripture is uh, a lot like the star that shined brightly on the night that Jesus was born into this world. Uh, it's a beacon it guides us to Him. It, I, I remember reading a book by author uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz some time ago, uh, years ago now. He raised the question in one of his books about a scenario in which the wise men have, might have worshipped the star of Bethlehem instead of the one to whom it led them. Can you imagine such a mistake as that? They would have missed the Christ child had that happened. I mean, these were most likely astrologers, as you probably know. They would have missed the Christ child if they'd worshipped the star instead of the one that it pointed them to. And yet that is exactly what sometimes happens when people come to the Bible. Because they misunderstand its content and its intended purpose, they miss its main character. They look for life lessons and they miss the life of those lessons that, and, and the life that those lessons are intended to bring us to see and to know. If you'll begin to read the Bible by asking the questions and applying the teachings that we've talked about and that, that's described in my book, Unlock Your Bible, you'll find Jesus throughout the whole Bible. The Bible is like that bright star that shined on the manger. It points us to Jesus. He's in every book of the Bible as we've seen today. The scriptures have been compared to a picture album. As I, as I said He's on every page in the New Testament. He's right there in the forefront and in, 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 in easy to see him. In the Old Testament, as I said, it's like where's Waldo? But he's there in the text. He, he's there. So to the one who carefully looks and prayerfully reads those texts, they will see Jesus and they'll be overwhelmed by his beauty and his gracious love. A lot of people think the Bible is a guidebook intended to give us direction. And I've hope I've adequately shown you that while it certainly can do that, giving direction is not the Bible's main purpose. Some people see it as a rules book telling us what to do and not to do and I'll tell you nothing can be further from the truth than that. And others see it as a textbook 
They study it so they can know the Bible. You know, they can parse Greek verbs. They take notes every time they hear a sermon. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But what good does it do if the only thing it is is simple knowledge? Simple knowledge apart from the source of that knowledge is empty and produces nothing but pride and a false sense of security. I guess if I were to call the Bible by any other descriptive name, I think I'd just call it a grace book. A grace book. Its purpose is to show us the loving grace of our Father as revealed to us through His Son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the heart of what authentic Christianity is all about. And that is the intended purpose that the Bible is to fulfill. If you've read the Bible and you haven't understood it, you're going to discover that the things that we've talked about, if you apply them to your life, they're going to help you. If you read the Bible and you feel condemned, you're using the wrong lens. You're still using the old covenant glasses. Throw away those old covenant glasses and start to read the Bible through the lens of the new covenant. The ones characterized by receptors that are open to the love and divine goodness that's directed toward you for no other reason than the simple fact that God is love. Don't attempt to live by the Bible. That's not why God gave it to you. Again, I emphasize this by repeating it. We are to live by the life of the Christ who indwells us. The Bible will help you understand Him and what it means to trust Him to express His life through you in practical ways in daily living. Your Bible is the most precious physical possession you may ever have. Treasure it. Enjoy the benefits it offers you. I've met persecuted Christians in other countries who've been imprisoned and even tortured because they owned or taught the Bible. And you know what? When they were released, a lot of them immediately began teaching the Bible and reading it again because that's how much they love it. They've seen Jesus in their Bibles. They've seen the Holy Spirit unlock the Bible and show them and help them understand how to apply it in ways that have been forever transformational to them by bringing them into an awareness of their union with the living God. And as we bring this to a close, it's my prayer that the Scriptures will come alive to you in fresh and new ways like you've never experienced until now. May your eyes be open. May you feel your Father's love as you read the Bible. And may you hear His voice gently whispering words of love to you. Don't be impatient if you don't immediately see a complete change in how you understand the Bible. Maybe you've been reading it through a legalistic lens for a long time. Your paradigm will change. Just keep reading it through the grace lens and discern which ones are for you and which ones are to you. Look for Jesus as you read and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. And He promised, Jesus did, that the Spirit will guide you into all truth. And you can depend on that to happen in your life. If you'd like to connect with me on a daily basis, I am online five days a week. Go to Grace Walk Experience. This is the Grace Walk message. The Grace Walk movement is online at gracewalkexperience.com. And you can find out there how to join the group and be a part of what we do, both live and recorded. God bless you as you go forward in your Grace Walk and in your study of the Bible. See you next time.